What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome back to this series titled Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We're studying the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray as we open the Word of God tonight. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for your grace, your power. Thank you for the prophetic word that gives us confidence to face the future. And thank you for these life-changing prophecies. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our presentation is Revelation's Biggest Surprise. When we study the book of Revelation, it's important to understand that God has given us clues to its prophetic symbols in the book of Daniel. So we're going to take a little detour from Revelation to begin and go to the book of Daniel. And here in the book of Daniel, we have a revelation of the future. You know, so many people look to the future and they're quite frightened, quite scared about the future. They're wondering, will we be destroyed in some thermonuclear war? Will global warming raise the water levels of coastal cities and will they be washed away? Will famine grip our earth? And often many, many parents who have children take their babies in their hands and they look at the eyes of these beautiful little ones and they say, what kind of future will my children have? What kind of future can I dream about for my own kids and my own family? If you're a parent, a father or mother, you too may wonder about the world your children will grow up in. Will it be a world of terrorism? Will it be a world of economic disaster? Will it be a world where diseases are so rampant and pestilences are so rampant that large parts of civilization will be destroyed? Will it be a world where thermonuclear war annihilates our cities? You know, you look at the eyes of your children and you say, what kind of world will they grow up in? I've got some incredibly good news for you. The book of Daniel, linked with the book of Revelation, provides for us keys regarding the future. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 puts it this way, the things that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Notice there are some things that are secret. There may be some things about the future we'd like to know, but they're not revealed. But I give God credit for making most plain what's most important. And so the things that God has revealed are for us to know. What does our text say? It's very clear. The secret things belong to who? The Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. So, the things that are revealed are very clear. Tonight, we're going to the book of Daniel, and we're going to look there at an ancient dream that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had in his bedroom. And as we study that dream, we see how history has been following prophecy for 2,500 years. The Bible predicted that four of, the, of four of the great nations that would ever rule the world from Daniel's day down to our day. Daniel the prophet lived about 600 years before Christ. He was a teenager when he was taken captive into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, one night, King Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep and had a dream. And in that dream, the Scripture puts it this way in Daniel, the second chapter, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now, you may have gone to sleep one night and had a dream, and you wake up the next morning, you say, what did I dream? 
something very similar happened to Nebuchadnezzar. If the scripture says, his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. In other words, the king went to sleep, had a dream. He woke up, couldn't remember his dream, and was really troubled about it. He knew that the dream had significance, eternal significance, but he couldn't remember it. So, as he was troubled, the king called all of his wise men to his kingly royal chamber to help him understand the dream. And so, Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, O king, live forever, his servants say. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give them, and we will give you the interpretation of that dream. Now, the king is wise. You see, the wise men say to him, King, you know, you just tell us what you dreamt in your bedroom the night before, and we'll tell you the meaning. Well, the king was too wise for that because if he told them what he dreamed, they could make up any interpretation and he would have no way of verifying whether that was right or wrong. So he said, no, if, if you can't tell me what I dreamed last night, how are you ever going to tell me what it means in the future? So if you're wise, tell me what did I dream? Now, the Bible says the astrologers were there. They are people that supposedly can read the future from the stars. It says the magicians were there. The Babylonian magicians would often cut the liver of a cow, and they would look at the design of the liver and supposedly try to tell the future. They would drop water on oil, watch the pattern uh, that would develop and try to therefore tell the future. And they were varied incantations that they used to tell the future. And the king said, look, you tell me, what did I dream last night? What does it mean? They said, king, that's not possible. In fact, they said to him, therefore tell me the dream and I'll know that you can give me its interpretation, the king says. If you don't tell me the dream, certainly you're not going to be able to tell me the interpretation. And what do they say? Daniel 2 verse 10, there's not a man on earth that can tell the king's matter. In other words, they acknowledge it's impossible. Nobody can do, king, what you're asking. Nobody can tell you what you dreamt and what it means. You tell us what did you dream. The king says, look, you either tell me what I dreamt or your head's going to come off. Arms, I'm going to chop them off. You're going to be annihilated. You're going to be uh, destroyed. Fear went through the whole empire. Daniel was not one of those wise men, but he was educated in the University of Babylon, so when the decree went forth, it impacted Daniel as well as the rest of the wise men. Daniel came in before the king, and he said, tell me, king, do you really need to know the interpretation of this dream? If it is so significant, give me time, and let me pray. Have you ever faced a critical moment in your life, something that you could not get through, some mountain you had to climb, some great difficulty that you had to, you were experiencing. God still answers prayer. God still comes in the quietness. When we have problems that seem to be overwhelming, problems that we cannot solve, the king gave Daniel that time. And as he did, Daniel went into his bedroom and he began to seek God. And Daniel opened his heart to God and the mysteries of eternity were revealed to Daniel. And he began to not only understand what the king had dreamed in his bedroom, but he began to understand what that dream meant. That night, Daniel had great assurance, great hope, great confidence that God had revealed to him the mysteries of the future. And Daniel said, Daniel 2 verse 23, I thank you and praise you, God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. Now notice two things about God. He gives us wisdom and he gives us might. When you don't know what to do, you know just what to do. To seek God for wisdom, to seek God for understanding, and to seek God for strength. God is the God of wisdom and God is the God of might. 
He reveals the future, but not only does he reveal the future, he is the architect of the future. Kingdoms rise and fall at the hands of the almighty God who architects, who guides, directs the future. And then Daniel says this as he comes in before the king, Daniel 2 verse 28, there is a God in heaven. Now notice what Daniel does not say. He doesn't say there might be a God in heaven. He, might, he doesn't say there it's possible that there's a God in heaven. He doesn't say it's highly likely that there, there's a God in heaven. What does he say? There is a God in heaven. Notice he goes on, who reveals secrets and he makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Now, there are three things about this text that are significant to us. The first phrase we've noticed, there is a God in heaven. Second, what does that God do? He's not silent. He reveals secrets. He opens up the mysteries of the future. Thirdly, he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So this dream will take us from Nebuchadnezzar's time down the stream of time. This dream will take us to the very last days of earth's history. And Daniel then begins to describe what the king dreamt in his bedroom. I, I, it must be incredibly amazing for that king to sit and listen to this very dream. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. The image, this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you and its form was awesome. King, you saw this great image. And I suppose that King Nebuchadnezzar sat on the end of his chair and he said, Daniel, that's it. That's exactly what I saw. I, I saw this great image. Daniel then begins to describe the image to the king. This image's head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That's it, Daniel. That's exactly what I saw. An image, head of gold, breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And king, not only that, but king, there is something else that you saw. You watched a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it broke it to pieces. Daniel, how did you know? Daniel, that's exactly what I saw, a great image. Then I saw the rock come, it smashed the image, it ground it to powder. That's exactly what I saw. Now, if you were the king, what would you be wondering at this point? Uh, you know, Daniel went on as he describes it. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff from the th summer threshing floors. This image was crushed totally. And what then happened? The wind carried them away. No trace was found for them. You can just imagine how the king's heart is beating faster and faster. He's anticipating the meaning of the dream. Then a stone, Daniel said, struck the image. It became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Let's summarize what the king see. So an image. In that image, there was a head of gold. In that image, there was the breast and arms of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay. Then a rock comes and smashes the image to powder, and the rock becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. Now, if you were the king, what would you be wondering about next? Exactly. You'd wonder, what does it mean? What is the interpretation of the dream? Daniel says in Daniel 2, verse 36, this is the dream. Now, we will tell the interpretation of before the king. Does Daniel say, here I am. I'm going to tell the interpretation before the king. What, what's the word? Is it I will tell the interpretation? What is it? We will tell the interpretation before the king. In other words, Daniel is saying, God and I are in partnership. The God that reveals secrets is the God that will tell the interpretation. You know, some people think that Bible prophecy is all a matter of guesswork. Their idea is that you really can't tell very much about prophecy, that everybody has their own interpretation of it. It's kind of like... Uh, 
let's suppose we want to interpret the prophecy. What does the head of gold represent? What do the breasts and arms of silver represent? What do the thighs of brass represent? What do the legs of iron represent, etc.? So what if I passed out a piece of paper to each one of you and said, write you what you think the interpretation is, and we'll put it in the hat, I'll close my eyes, I'll pull the interpretation out of the hat. Is that a good way to interpret prophecy? Well, 2 Peter chapter 1 says, no prophecy is of private interpretation. The same God that gives the prophecy enables us to understand prophecy. So for every prophecy that God gives, that God explains the prophecy to us. That's why Daniel says, back to the text, this is the dream. Now we, that is God and Daniel, will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So God and Daniel were in partnership. Daniel begins now to explain the meaning of the dream. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37 and verse 38. He says, you, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. There can be no question about that. No question about that interpretation. It's very simple. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you, your kingdom, represents this head of gold. You, the Babylonian, as king of the Babylonian empire, are the representative empire in this dream. You are the first empire in the entire dream. Now, gold was a very fitting symbol for Babylon. Babylon ruled the world from 605 to 539 B.C. It was then, of course, defeated by the Medes and Persians. Gold was a symbol that was used throughout Babylon. It was used quite lavishly throughout the empire. If you look at the nation of Babylon or the city of Babylon, Babylon was about 130 or 40 miles south of modern Baghdad. It was a really a fantastic city. The river Euphrates ran through the center of Babylon, giving it a constant water supply. The Babylonians also had a 20-year food supply within the city, and we're told when the Medes and Persians surrounded them under Cyrus, the, some of the soldiers could have gone up on the walls and actually taunted the Medes and Persians and said, you know, you've surrounded us, you think you're going to starve us out in this siege, but we have enough food here for 20 years years. Gold was lavishly used in Babylon. Just to get an idea of the lavishness of the city, Babylon was about 10 miles around. Uh, the historian Herodotus says some feel that that may be a little large, but it certainly was an amazing city. To compare to Rome, Rome was about six miles in circumference around, Athens four miles. So Babylon was one of the certainly the wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon built for Nebuchadnezzar's Lebanese wife. Uh, were one of the marvels of the world. Uh, the architecture was just quite incredible. Uh, the Babylonians had 13 different gods. Bel Marduk was the chief god of Babylon, and the temple to Bel Marduk was 300 feet high. Now, if you're a builder, you know that about one story is 10 to 12 feet, and so picture a building 30 stories high. Just quite an amazing temple to Bel Marduk. Now, Bel Marduk was a golden god who sat in that temple, and the temple contained 18 tons. That's 18 tons of gold. The god Belmarduk, a golden god, sat on a golden throne before a golden table by a golden altar. So gold was lavishly used through Babylon and certainly a marvelous symbol of the nation of Babylon. But yet, whereas Nebuchadnezzar had wished the entire image was all of gold, where he would have wished that the, there was no breast and arms of silver and thighs of brass and legs of iron representing another kingdom. Notice the scripture says in Daniel 2 verse 32, it's chest and arms of silver. Now there is a descending value as you go, gold, silver, brass, and iron. There's this descending value indicating moral decline, indicating the decay in these various empires. So Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, after you shall arise another kingdom. 
Now, if you're Nebuchadnezzar, what are you thinking? No, Lord, that's not going to be true. The whole image is going to be gold. No, Lord, not after me there will arise another kingdom. Nothing doing, Lord. That's not the plan. That's not part of the program that I've outlined. My kingdom is going to reign forever. In fact, the archaeologists digging in Babylon have found some interesting things. First, they found bricks in procession way, that is the royal pathway that leads through the Ishtar gate in Babylon. But in those bricks, every one of them had Nebuchadnezzar's name stamped on it. Thousands of bricks with Nebuchadnezzar's name. In addition to that, a clay tablet was found. And as the archaeologists came along and dug up that clay tablet, this is what it said, O Babylon, the delight of mine eyes, may it last forever. You see, Nebuchadnezzar wanted his kingdom to survive. He wanted it to last forever, but that was not to be. Another kingdom would arise after you. In Daniel chapter 5, we are told about the great feast of Babylon. By now, Nebuchadnezzar has died. Belshazzar, grandson, has this great feast. He throws it. And as this feast is lavishly thrown, the Medes and Persians surround the ancient city of Babylon. And there on the wall is written the very word, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Teko, you are weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The bloodless hand writes upon the wall, before that time in this lavish feast, long road Babylonian statesmen hold close, finely gowned, perfumed Babylonian women. War wine flows like water, and in their drunken debauchery, immorality is taking place. There's feasting and partying and drinking and music. But that hand writes on the wall, your kingdom is divided, and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. That night, Cyrus attacks the empire. Now, here's the fascinating thing. God names Cyrus approximately 150 years before he was born that he would be the ruling general that would overthrow the nation of Babylon. Here's the prophecy. Isaiah 45, verse 1. You don't want to miss this one. Isaiah wrote in about 680 B.C., the Babylonian Empire over, was overthrown by the Medes and Persians in 539. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, Cyrus not even born yet, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. Now, let's look at that prophecy. Cyrus is named by name, and Cyrus is described as the one, the Persian king, that would come down and overthrow Babylon. It says that the river would be dry, the river Euphrates going underneath the walls. It says that the gates would not be shut. What's that all about? In Babylon, there were gates around the city. Remember about 10 miles in circumference? There's around it. The, the walls were so wide that two chariots could race side by side on top of the walls. In addition to that, the, the, when the river flowed through the city, they had double protection because the gates on the, along the river inside of the city were double gates. They had the outer gates around the city, the gates on the river. The gates on that river, the inner gates, were left open that night during the drunken feast. What, did, what happened? What actually took place? Nebuchadnezzar it dies. Then his successor comes. Then Belshazzar comes. And then Belshazzar has this drunken feast. Cyrus drains the Euphrates River, takes his troops, marches them under the gates. They come up inside the city. And as they come up inside the city, the other gates are not open. They rush through those gates, attack Babylon, and in one night, Babylon is overthrown. Exactly like the Bible prophecy said, Cyrus was to rule, he did. The gates were not to be shut, they were not. 
river dried up? It was. We see all this described today in archaeology on the famous Cyrus Cylinder, which is the record of Cyrus' attack on Babylon and how he lets Israel go free back to worship exactly like the Bible predicted. Prophecy does not guess. This book has been accurate down through the centuries, naming empires, naming world leaders, naming their methods of attack down through the centuries. God's Word has been accurate. We can have confidence in what God says about the future because what He said about the past indeed has come true. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 B.C. Then Medo-Persia would rule from 539 to 331. Would that nation rule forever? Daniel 2, verse 39. Then another kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Babylon would rule. Then Medo-Persia would rule. Then a third kingdom would rule. You remember the nation that overthrew Medo-Persia? What was it? Students of history. What was it? It was Greece, of course, the third successive world ruling empire. And you know, a lot of the armor of the Greeks was made out of bronze. So bronze, a very fitting symbol for the Greek empire. Greece ruled, Greece reigned. So you've got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. And who was it that was the great leader of Greece? Alexander the Great, of course. And then a fourth empire would rule. Here it is, Daniel 2 verse 40. And the fourth empire shall be strong as iron. What nation was it that overthrew the mighty Greek empire? The nation of Rome. In fact, in those monumental volumes called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon put it this way. He used really the very symbolism of prophecy, the images of gold, silver or brass, that might serve to represent the nations and their kings, were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Isn't it quite stunning? Isn't it quite amazing? Isn't it quite remarkable that the chronicler of the Roman Empire uses the language of Daniel, the second chapter, to describe the rise of Rome, gold, silver, brass, and iron. Very remarkable here. So the Roman Empire rules. The Roman Empire rules from 168 B.C. to about 476 A.D. From 351 to 476, the Roman Empire was indeed falling apart. Rome ruled, as you can see from the map, shaded in red here on the screen. The Roman Empire rules from Spain throughout Europe down to the boot modern Italy, over through Turkey, down through parts of Asia, down, of course, along the Mediterranean sea coast through the nation of Israel today, all across northern Africa and into the Middle East. It was just an amazing empire. And it was strong as iron. In the days of Rome, of course, Christ was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. It was a decree of, C uh, uh, of the Caesars that uh, brought him and the Holy Family from Nazareth to Bethlehem when all the world would be taxed. It was in the days of Rome that a decree was passed that male children be killed, and so Mary and Joseph go to Egypt in the days of Rome. It was in the days of Rome, it was a Roman tribunal that tried Christ and Roman soldiers that nailed Jesus to the cross. So you see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, four great world ruling empires. And then what would you predict next? What would happen next after Rome? You know, if a human being were predicting, they might predict gold, silver, brass, iron, copper, tin, zinc. They might predict empire after empire after empire. Not so. The Bible says, Daniel 2 verse 41, whereas you saw feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. What does it say, everybody, about the kingdom? What does it say? The kingdom shall be what? A fifth world ruling empire? A sixth world ruling empire? A seventh? Is that what it says? It says, whereas you saw 
the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be, what everybody? The kingdom shall be divided. So if this prophecy would be accurate, what we would expect now after the breakup of Rome would be the divisions of the Roman Empire. We would expect something to happen that would be quite unusual regarding the toes and feet of that image. What happened? Exactly like the prophecy predicted, the barbarian tribes came down from the north. And as they did, Europe was carved up. The Suevi in the area of Spain and Visigoths in the area of Portugal and Spain and the Franks warring tribe settled and battled back the Roman Empire in the area of France. And you come down to the Alamenni in the area of Germany. These are all barbarian tribes attacking parts of the empire. The empire was getting, of course, much, much weaker now. It was struggling. The empire is falling apart. It is being divided just like the Bible predicted. But the Bible does not stop there. Not at all. The Bible continues. It says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now notice what they're going to do. There is going to be an attempt to unite the empire. That attempt to unite the empire is going to come in two ways. First, the mingling of seed. What does the mingling of seed mean? The mingling of seed has to do with intermarriage, that the royal families of Europe would intermarry in attempting to unite all of Europe in the mingling of seed. Secondly, there would be battles, there would be strife, there would be bloodshed. The history of modern Europe today clearly reveals the truthfulness of this prophecy. The history of Europe clearly reveals this attempt in the mingling of seed. Let's go to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark. It's an amazing castle, beautiful ride as you come across the bay, coming into the castle, quite magnificent. But the thing that we want to pause is in the entryway of the castle. There is the family tree of Europe. And this family tree of Europe shows how the kings of Denmark, which was a very strong empire at the time, and the, and the queens of that nation would intermarry their family off in an attempt to unite all of Europe through intermarriage, the mingling of seeds. This was also done, of course, in the days of Napoleon. Some of you may remember the history of this. Napoleon divorces his wife, Josephine. He marries Louise of Austria, and he wants to unite the Napoleonic line in Europe with the Habsburg line to try to, through intermarriage, the mingling of seed, have the dominant force in Europe. He wants his nation to be the all-powerful nation. The Bible says, Daniel 2, verse 43, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with Mary Clay. So just as iron and clay do not mix, Europe would remain divided. I'm preaching in Europe. I'm talking to thousands. After the meeting, man comes up to me and he says, how do you know the Bible is true? You're standing on it. How do you know the Bible is true? You're standing on it. What? Yeah, you're standing on it. What are you talking about? You're standing on the very earth that confirms the truthfulness of this book. You see, my friend, in Daniel, the second chapter, the Bible speaks about four nations that would be the dominant world ruling powers, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then it does not tell us that Rome is going to be followed by a fifth world ruling power. It says that Rome would be divided. 
and that the iron in clay represented in the toes of the image would never again be permanently united. That very ground that you are standing on, my friend, is the clear evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Because for the last, since the fall of the Roman Empire in the year 476, for the last 15, 1600 years, Europe has been divided exactly like the prophecy predicts. Think of those people that have tried to unite Europe. I think of Charles V with his mighty armies coming across Europe, trying to bring Europe into very close harmony again, trying to dominate Europe. Charles V failed. Or I think, for example, of Charlemagne, who wanted to establish the Holy Roman Empire. But Charlemagne's efforts failed. You look at the great world rulers, Napoleon, for example. We mentioned him a little earlier through intermarriage. Napoleon tried to unite all of Europe. But he also tried to unite Europe with his mighty armies. Napoleon again and again and again attempted to attack and to take over Europe. When Napoleon was defeated, just before that, he wrote in his journal, before his final defeat, he said, there will be one Europe. There'll be one currency. There'll be one language. There'll be one government over all of Europe. What did Napoleon neglect to understand? He neglected to understand this marvelous prophecy in Ezekiel, rather after Ezekiel in the book of Daniel, the second chapter. This is what Napoleon failed to understand. What does he say? He says there'll be one Europe, there'll be one currency, there'll be one language, there'll be one government over all of Europe. That's what Napoleon says. But what does the Bible say? Daniel chapter 2, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what? The kingdom shall be divided. So the Bible is very clear. The nations of Europe would never be permanently reunited again. The kingdoms would be divided. When Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, he threw up his hands and he said, God Almighty is too much for me. And the truth of the matter is, God Almighty is too much for any world ruler. The prophecies of Daniel are following the exact pattern that God has established. History is following those prophecies like a blueprint. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 B.C. Medo-Persia ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. The Greeks ruled from 331 until they were defeated by the Romans in 168. Roman rules for 500 years, about 351, the empire begins to crumble. The barbarian tribes come down from the north. Europe is carved up exactly like the Bible prophecy predicts. The Bible does not guess, it knows. Prophecy is not some wild-eyed speculation by some psychic, but prophecy is revealing history based on the very mind and heart of God. The Bible says, Daniel 2, verse 43, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not. Does it say they may not? Does it say they might not? Does it say it's possible that they won't? What does it say? They will not. Here is a certainty of Bible prophecy that you indeed can stake your life on. Divided Europe from 476 A.D. to the present, the feet of iron and clay, exactly like the Bible predicted. There have been numerous would-be world leaders. Stalin wanted to rule the world and dominate. Hitler wanted to rule the world. Napoleon wanted to dominate Europe. Charlemagne, Charles V, but they've gone down into insignificance because Scripture says that prophecy cannot be broken. The word of the living God has been indeed fulfilled down through the centuries. I think of Hitler. 
Hitler rose. His panzer division tanks came across Europe, taking one country after the other. Austria fell before the mighty German armies. The Belgium fell. The Scandinavian countries. Hitler is moving across Europe. And Hitler says this in a speech, March 1941, to my people. We do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may leave us alone. This was Hitler's great dream to conquer Europe and indeed conquer the world. He says, we want to fight our own war with our own guns without God. But yet, Hitler's armies were defeated in an amazing invasion called the invasion of Dunkirk. Let me give you some background of that invasion and how miraculous it really was as the Allied forces came across the English Channel. They had landed at Dunkirk. Over 300,000 of the Allied forces. Hitler's German armies fought back furiously. The Americans, the Allies with the British forces and others, had their backs to the wall to the English Channel. Hitler's panzer divisions were moving. There was no place for the Allied forces to go. It appeared that they would be defeated. It appeared that the armies would be crushed. But as Hitler's forces moved across, it began to rain on the English side of the channel. The rain was pouring down as it was. It slowed down the German general's tanks. Then, surprisingly enough, an order was given, halt. As that order was given, on the continents, on the English side of the English Channel, across from the continent, the King of England, King George, called a day of fasting and prayer. The British had been praying, but now there was this earnest petition to God. Lights on churches went on up and down the English Channel. They were earnestly on their knees praying, God, work a miracle. God, do something here. God, save this nation. Save Europe. The fog on the English Channel lifted. Winston Churchill said, we have to evacuate. And the famous evacuation of Dunkirk took place of thousands of troops. And by the time Hitler got his tanks up and going, most of the Allied forces were evacuated miraculously. The weather on the continent side was bad. The fog lifted. Everything that floated came across the English Channel. Why? Do you know, during this period of time, there was an editor of a magazine called Signs of the Times. It was being published at that time, the European edition in England. And he put a picture on the cover of the Signs of the Times of the image of Daniel II, with the head of gold, breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay, and the fact that Europe couldn't be united again. When he did, colleagues said, you're foolish. Why would you do that? Because it looks like Hitler's going to win. He said, because I believe Bible prophecy. And he was right. History has been following prophecy like a blueprint. The prophecies of the book of Daniel indeed have been fulfilled down through history for 2,500 years. Now, how does this all tie in with the book of Revelation? Let's go to Revelation chapter 17, verse 12 to 14. Just as you have ten toes on the image, there's a beast that rises in Revelation 17, and it says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who've received no kingdom yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So Daniel predicted Europe would never be permanently reunited. Revelation picks up on that prophecy and says that for a very short time, just before the time of the end, church and state would unite. There would be a beast power, the kings of the earth, beast power, religious power. These powers would unite for a short time before the coming of Jesus. These are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. So just before the coming of Jesus, the nations of Europe would coalesce again. 
the nations of Europe just for a short time. No permanent cohesive unity would take place. It hasn't taken place, but we would expect just before the return of our Lord, we'd expect those nations to begin to coalesce again. Think of the European common market. The theme of the European common market is many voices, one people. Again, you think of this whole coalescing, coalescing of Europe, so much conflict, so much difficulty, this trying to bring Europe together, uh, common currency, the euro. It's kind of interesting with Brexit and Britain pulling out of the common market. Uh, that is shaky today, of course, but prophecy predicts that one day, because of conflict, strife, because of economic disaster, because of the problems that this world will face, that there would be this coming together for a short period of time of the nations of the world, including Europe. But as church and state unite, as a beast power arises, as conflict occurs, as there's this tempt for unity, what does the Bible say? Revelation 17, 12 to 14, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will do what? What's the Lamb going to do? The Lamb is going to overcome them. Have you, what a strange scene that is. Have you ever seen a dragon fight a lamb? No, you say, I never even saw a dragon. Well, neither did I. Uh, but this great, mighty, mythical beast, this dragon, supposedly fights the Lamb. Who do you think is going to win? In this battle, Jesus, the Lamb, becomes victorious. Why? Revelation 17, verse 12 to 14. Here's the great theme of Revelation. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. And those that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. He sets up kings and takes down kings. Babylon rises and falls. Medo-Persia rises and falls. Grecia rises and falls. Rome rises and falls. The empires are divide, the empire of Rome is divided, the toes of the image divided down through history, just like the Bible has predicted. We see history following this prophecy just like a blueprint. Here is God's prophetic blueprint of history. But wait, there's one more scene in the story. What is it? There will be a rock cut out without hands, and that rock cut out without hands will come and smash the image. Here's what the Bible says, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, you watched. While a stone was cut out without hands. What does it mean, without hands? It means a divine act of history. No human being can architect this. No human being can design this. A rock cut out without hands. Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, will come down the stream of time to return to this earth to deliver His people. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the image, the image of humanity, the image of the nations on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. This earth is not in the hands of human beings. This earth is not in the hands of political leaders. Social scientists do not have the answer to the world's problems. The greatest political leaders don't have the answer to the world's problems. The greatest educators don't have the answer to the world's problems. Jesus Christ has that answer to the problems of this world. Notice it says, Daniel 2 and verse 44, it, the kingdom of God, it, this rock cut out without hands, is this great mountain, will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Babylon rises and falls, Medo Persia rises and falls, Greece rises and falls, Rome rises and falls, the empire is divided, but the kingdom of God stands forever and ever and ever and ever. And that, my friend, is incredibly good news. Revelation 11, verse 15 echoes this. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign for how long? forever and ever and ever and ever. A number of years ago, there was a missionary in Liberia, and every day as he drove to the small mission college to teach Liberian pastors, 
He drove by scenes of poverty. He drove by scenes of terrorism. He drove by scenes of war. It was not unusual to see dead bodies lying in the street. It was not unusual to see children starving. One day in class, during the middle of the Liberian Civil War, he was teaching pastors, and he was teaching them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as he did, he read to them this marvelous passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And as he read the passage, the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And he continues to read, thus we shall always be with the Lord. One of his students couldn't control themselves, just kept raising his hand. And the student said, Jesus is going to come with a shout, professor? Yes, He is. I have a question. Yes. What's he going to shout? What's he going to shout? The professor stopped. He said, I never thought about that before. What is he going to shout? Silence in the class. But the professor said, well, we're not sure what he's going to shout. Student, not happy. But what is he going to shout? Professor, we're not sure. Student, what's he going to shout? And the professor finally says, I got an idea. I know what he's going to shout. I know what he's going to shout. I know what he's going to shout. He's going to shout enough. Enough bloodshed. Enough horror, enough sorrow, enough death, enough pain, enough suffering. I know what he is going to shout. He is going to shout enough, enough cancer, enough heart disease, enough, de enough death, enough children with distended bellies who are dying on the streets of starvation, enough children being brought up without parents who died of AIDS. Jesus is going to shout, it is enough, because Jesus is going to come again. The great hope of this world is the return of Jesus Christ. And the prophecies of the book of Daniel, the prophecies of the book of Revelation, point us forward to that hope. You know, my friend, in times like these, we need the hopeful message of this book. In times like these, we need a Savior. Listen as Celestine sings. In times like this, you need a Savior. In times like this, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid this rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. like this you need a bible in times like these or oh, be not idle be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like this, I have a Savior 
In times like these, I have an anchor. I'm very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, we need a Savior. Do you know that Savior? Do you know Jesus? His arms are wide open for you. I wonder if you're watching this telecast, and maybe you have that sense of fear and foreboding about the future. Maybe you don't have the confidence that you'd be ready if Jesus came very, very soon. Maybe there's something in your life that's keeping you from being ready for the coming of Christ. There is some attitude. There's some habit. Maybe you once knew Him and you walked away. Maybe you're a Christian, but you're just playing games with Christianity. God's speaking to you right now. God's talking to your heart right now, wherever you are. Or would you just like to bow your head and say, Jesus, I'm going to give up that thing. Jesus, I'm going to surrender that thing. Jesus, I'm going to surrender that habit. Just now, would you like to say, Jesus, I am fully yours because in times like these, I need a Savior. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are there, that history is not some kaleidoscope of random events, that history is not some mixed-up hodgepodge of human working, but that you're in control of history, that you've guided down through the nations, and that you will come again, that you are the ultimate answer to history. Just now we open our hearts to you to be ready for that glorious day when Christ returns, and we pray it in His name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this Revelations Ancient Discoveries series. It will continue here on 3ABN, and we are journeying through the entire book of Revelation. We will go into some of the deepest prophecies of Revelation. We'll see a clear view of the future. The past and its accuracy tells us about what God's going to do in the future. Stay with us. I look forward to seeing you in future broadcasts.